All right. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Cast Bitten, a Gungeon Synth podcast, and I'm the host, Trev. And today, our guest is none other than Tristan, the guy behind Dungeon Synth Project, Elevalon. Elevalon just released their debut album titled Nimway's Gift. You just heard a song off of that release. That one's titled The Trial of the Golden Arrow. And that's probably my favorite track off the album. I like it a ton. Uh, outside of this genre, Tristan also makes kind of post-rock metal style music under the moniker Bone Weaver, and that music is just excellent as well. It's super cool. So yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm super happy to have you. Thanks for having me, and glad to hear you like my other stuff. I'm uh, yeah. you know, definitely all over with the genres, but uh, yeah, all about creating music, so glad for to be sure. here. For sure. Uh, that, did I pass the pronunciation test? I know we just went over it. I yep, immediately 100%. forgot that. No, you got it. It was perfect. hundred <laughs> okay, percent. Great. Great. I kind of want to dive into that. Cause you, you hinted at it when we were talking in the pre-show. Um, what's the story there? What's the, the name of the album and the project? Uh, what does that all mean? So as far as the album goes, Nimue's gift, um, Nimue is the name of the Lady of the Lake from Arthurian myth and legend. And so by that, like, logic, Nimue's gift would be uh, Excalibur, right? Because the Lady of the Lake bestows Excalibur upon uh, King Arthur. And so that really is like, in my mind, Nimue's gift is like the... um, the gift of something that's like pointing towards a higher, you know, metaphysical idea, maybe that, you know, the bearer of this sword is, has the the right to rule. And in, in my mind, the way I'm viewing that is like, you know, you have, you're being given the gift of, you know, what you can take and use to go out and forge your own destiny. You can become the ruler of yourself. Um, something I really wanted to portray with this album was just like, you know, really inspire the listener with a sense of adventure and uh, like, you know, like a lighthearted, but also really heartening sound that, you know, makes you feel like you can go and do the things you need to do, whether they're, you know, epic quests in the bucolic wildlands of some fantasy world, or, you know, just the things you need to do to make you, you know, to make you happy with yourself. And, uh, that's to me that's the gift the gift of adventure and the gift of uh striking out and making something of yourself so that's kind of the idea of the the album name what an Um, answer that's so good i i love how much thought is into that yeah so really the the inspiration for me for that anyways like i don't know there's something about old timey like classic mythological like origin stories and fantasy stories and um, yeah for this album i was really inspired by um the merry adventures of robin hood and uh, arthurian myth and legend and so those two things for me i really wanted to capture that you know lighthearted and fanciful feeling of you know having a band of adventurers in the wilds going about yeah. to their heart's content and you know that sort of thing and so i thought that was the name that uh that could do it for me so yeah i think you absolutely hit the nail on the head there um like even on the just very surface level the the imagery that you get from nimway's gift uh, already works perfect but then yeah it seems like you put a lot of thought into it and yeah i totally think that the album conveys what you're going for there that i had a big grand sense of fantasy and adventure and, and some merriment but also some danger Right. Yeah. You got to have both. There is <laughs> right, no adventure right. without danger. That's what my, uh, one of my high school teachers always used to say. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then the name of, uh, Elevalon itself, I lifted that from a video game that hopefully some listeners might know of, because I have a, I have a feeling that dungeon crawl stone soup and dungeon synth have some level of, you know, cross, <laughs> uh, cross like platform or similar uh, right. viewership or um, right. anyways but it's yeah that's a game that i absolutely love um i think it came out originally in the 90s as a game called lindley's dungeon crawl um but it's one of those roguelike games where you know you boot it up and you see like a text screen and it says yeah like, pick your species and you know you can be like a, a human or an elf or a, a frog man or an octopus or a minotaur or <laughs> you know, all kinds of wild stuff yeah but uh one thing i you know is cool about the game is you can pick a religion to uh 
you know, to become a, a devotee of or an acolyte of. And um, one of the ones, so the, the in that game, the god of like healing and peaceful nature is Elevalon. And so okay. Elevalon helps you pacify your foes and make friends with them and that sort of thing. And, you know, I just thought it was a really cool word. And the old school, you know, um, ASCII or like tile-based dungeon crawler game, I thought fit really well with the, you know, the dungeon synth vibes. There's a lot of uh, synergy going on there. So yeah. I thought that worked. And, and it's nice for the source material to be fitting, but also not covered because there's a ton of, of great source material that is really heavily covered. And while that's exciting, it's not I, like, I don't know anyone else with, uh, I, I, I Googled Elevalon and I saw those words that you said, dungeon crawl soup something. And I, and I <laughs> my brain just said, you know what? Let's not look into it. That's going to make the interview more fun. I feel like that works so great for, I don't know, pulling some original sound from an original source material that, that hasn't been covered. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I love Tolkien as much as the next guy, you know, huge Lord of the Rings fan, big fan of Silmarillion, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know, I, I definitely have like this really strong affinity for yeah, dungeon crawl stone soup and a number of other things that, you know, we can get into as track titles and <laughs> things go. But um, yeah, I wanted to do something a little different. And uh, I don't think anyone has done anything on dungeon crawl stones, stone soup. It's got a pretty cult following, but you know, still pretty under the radar so right. i thought it was kind of clever and the high fantasy you know feeling of it the retro high fantasy i just i thought it was perfect yeah yeah that that kind of brings me to a little lower in my notes but uh with your your attention to detail with with the word choice and what that means and everything i kind of want to talk about that passage that just two paragraph section that's written at the bottom of your your band camp for nimway's gift I guess, first off, did you write that? Yeah, so that's original. Um, oh, man. I love your use of language there. It's <laughs> it's so exciting, and it establishes the theme so well. Uh, yeah, what, what were you going to say just then? I mean, I was just going to say, like, yeah, it's it's original text that I came up with it. I, I think, you know, I was setting up the Bandcamp page. I sat down, and, like, I knew I had to come up with something for that because I wanted, you know, something to – tie it all together so I, I probably sat for like an hour and just listened to like something atmospheric and wrote it all it's basically my life philosophy i think um i don't know that's like when i need to be inspired to do something like these are the <laughs> kinds of thoughts i tell myself these are the things i want you to feel these are you know this is what i hope that just by virtue of living and interacting with people um that this is what I can kind of show to them, you know, that there's adventure out there. You just have to go find it and get it for yourself. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with my own life. So, and this oh is how, gosh. you know, I'm trying to set the scene for uh, what I want the sounds of uh, Elevalon to be like, and this is what I could come up with. So, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I, in the, I believe in the fog weaver episode, them and I were kind of talking about, people in the dungeon synth realm are really willing to to fully commit to 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 what they're presenting and i feel like this just really works with that it's it's definitely not a halfway effort it's uh i feel like i'm i'm looking at it now the mirthful indeed the cry of a noble soul yearning it's just it's it's so uh so rich and and so seeped in the way that the album feels i really really like that that really goes the extra mile yeah that's you know that's what i was trying to do with this album is really you know make something that's special to me and uh make something that i can look look back at and be like you know what that's as good as i could have made that and you know having like the the lyrics on the tracks and having the the couple of paragraphs to sort of sum up my feeling of it i think is what i needed to do to make sure that yeah. i felt like i had created that cohesive product and that's so cool so I, I know that you have your Bone Weaver stuff, which is is very, uh, I would say like like timbre and, and stylistically very different than this. Um, and it from from sleuthing around online myself, it seems like you haven't done anything with the medieval feel before then. Yeah. How did you How did you get started with that? How do you go from making like you know heavier uh, 
post-rock style music into something so so niche like this so i mean i really grew up on fantasy and and like heavy metal like those are my my whole <laughs> life those have been my two big things i love fantasy right, right. uh you know i've always been huge on reading and old fantasy movies and the lord of the rings and you know all that stuff and that and uh and you know i got into heavy metal as a kid i think i've always just been predisposed towards liking you know more minor key and dark uh type things um you know like um as a kid i would listen to the lord of the rings soundtrack and then like pound the black riders theme on the piano as loud as i could and <laughs> you know i loved like classical songs that are really dark like uh march slav I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it's a very brooding sort of funeral no. march uh, song. Uh, I think it's Tchaikovsky. Um, okay. But yeah, stuff like that. You know, I was really into that. And then uh, pretty early on, I started getting into like old Black Sabbath and old old metal. And from there, you know, it just deeper and deeper into metal until, you know, by high school, I'm listening to Death and uh, Mastodon and Gojira and yeah. all sorts of other, um, you know, metal bands, death metal and doom metal, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so... I've been a musician my whole life and, you know, in middle and high school really got into making heavy metal. And, uh, as a creative type, you know, I just wrote lots of music and, uh, the long way down by bone weaver, that, that was my f like first real, uh, release of any music I had done. It took about six years and wow. you know, really did pretty much everything on that record. Um, I had the drums actually gone through by a real drummer because I didn't play the drums yet. But, um, <laughs> you know, we uh, we figured that out. And, you know, I wrote everything, did all the vocals and the guitar and bass yeah. and synthesizers. And uh, after that released, you know, I was looking for a new project to do. Um, and I had some Bone Weaver 2 type stuff written up and was thinking about, you know, diving into it. Um, I had a number of other, I have a number of other genres and projects planned too, but uh I don't know. I had probably, I think it was about two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, I really discovered Dungeon Synth. You know, I knew of some like, you know, old uh, like summoning or um, mm -hmm. even some like, you know, some, there are various like air quotes, black metal bands that really just do Dungeon Synth. And right. I knew of some of them and I'd listened to some of it, but I hadn't really like fallen in love with the genre yet. Um, but then I discovered the Dungeon Synth archives page probably like two and a half years ago. And once that hit, it clicked and it's like, oh, I've liked Dungeon Synth my whole <laughs> life. I just didn't know it. Just didn't um, have it in words. Right. So, yeah, after, after that, I was like, you know, I, I would just listen to it a ton, listen to it at work yeah. every day and like really fell in love with the genre. And then I was reading right soon after I released The Long Way Down, I was reading uh robin hood again and it just had this like every few pages i'd be like wow what an amazing quote that would be a fantastic song title <laughs> and i would write them all down and i was like yeah it's too bad i don't have like a you know it's too bad i just make metal and then i was like wait a second doesn't have I, to be that way <laughs> yeah i don't just have to make metal <laughs> and so uh, as my kind of quarantine project i i dove into making something special out of this and that's kind of wow. where it started um so so the very staunchly renaissance style sound sticks out to me even within the dungeon synth field um w whether on purpose or if it's not intentional a lot of artists don't really get that true to form like old school renaissance style uh, that you just totally nail all of the like rhythmically and color wise and the matching timbre of the instruments is, is all right there I'm kind of interested in how you tapped into that sound. Um, if aside from Dungeon Synth, were you listening to like older, uh, like uh, actual Renaissance era music or movie soundtrack? Uh, I don't know. What, what, what were your reference tracks while you were making this? Kind of a mix. Um, I definitely like uh, all the compendium albums by Dim were big on okay. my rotation while I was doing a lot of this. And sometimes here and there I would reference like a, um, it depends. If I'm going for a certain instrument, I might say like listen to a, a Moth Tower record or uh, some mm. Fief. Uh, but really, for yeah, for a lot of the more like I wanted a lot of it to sound traditionally medieval, um, and so I did a few things. Um, there are a few YouTube channels that I would go to that had a lot of good like really old sounding music, and I tried to just figure out what like made those 
or like tick, you know, like yeah. what, like trying to deconstruct what it is that made them sound so medieval. Um, so there's like a, there's a, a, it's a video, I think it's called like Vox Vulgaris or it, I think it's a group. Um, okay. but yeah, Vox Vulgaris is like a Renaissance late medieval, um, sort of recreation band and they have some, it's kind of hard to find the recordings. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was, that was a source of some of the more like r- the reedier songs where I wanted that really kind of, yeah. uh, yeah, that reedy sound to it. Um, I definitely used Vox Vulgaris for a few of those. And then um, I'm trying to remember the name of the YouTube channel. I think it's called Musica uh, Medieval, which is like a a YouTube channel that just posts albums of like old style, um, like old style medieval type music. Um, and so I referenced that a fair amount. I also went to the, uh, the library actually, uh, in Verona oh, no way. <laughs> and, uh, I found some like Gregorian chanting and other things and tried to deconstruct, you know, a variety of different like religious music. Uh, cause you know, so much of that music back in the day was, you know, for religious purpose and right. a lot of that's super cool. And it just, you know, hits home this, uh, you know, this feeling of like, uh, just the, immensity of of the cosmos and i don't know that sort of thing so i tried to deconstruct a lot of uh you know things that they're doing rhythms that they're using and uh yeah see if i could uh make something that was a passable simulacrum of what they were doing and i guess (laughs) i think from what you're saying i did a good job so heck yeah yeah i think you did i think that's kind of an important lesson that i 100 percent agree with if you want to sound like something there's so much power in analyzing the thing that you want to sound like like really sitting down and and doing a study of whatever it is Uh, i think that lets you tap in really well yeah got to do the work to an extent if if you want to be the thing you got to figure out what makes the thing that thing and then do what it does deconstruct it yeah um so you mentioned Dungeon Synth Archives. Uh, I was curious, have you sent your album off there? It seems like, uh, well, I I guess I'll step back uh, a couple paragraphs earlier in the notes. It seems like your release is doing really well. This uh, just came out, what was it, a week or two weeks ago? It came out September 6th. Okay, so so a little three-ish, a little over three weeks ago, yeah. Okay, Um, but yeah, it seems like it's, it's going really well. People in my personal circles, as well as looking at online, they're really liking it. You've got uh, rave reviews on Bandcamp. Um, what what do you think about the release? How 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 has that been going? And and if you feel like it's been as successful as it seems, what have you done to make that happen? It's it's been blowing my mind, man. I'm I'm really yeah. excited about how it's been going. Uh, yeah, I've had a lot of sales and a lot of people, you know, just getting lots of messages from. You know, random people I've never met on the internet who are like, this means so much to me. You know, <laughs> I have so many strong emotions when I listen to your music and like, dang, it's a good feeling. It feels great. So, uh, yeah, the release has been good. And I did send the music over to the Dungeon Synth Archives. Didn't get a response. As far as I understand, it's, um, you know, he, the whoever runs that can be pretty hard to track down. So I, I'm, I'm hoping yeah. uh, it gets uploaded there. I think it'll be great for, uh, for El Avalon if, you know, I, if I can get it up onto the Dungeon Synth archives. I think the quality's there, I would like to think. Um, so hopefully it ends up on, on the channel. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, regardless. It's, it's difficult saying that about your own work. Like, yeah, it's got to be good enough. But I, I know what you mean if you have confidence in it. Um, I think that it would be a home there. I think it totally totally fits the bill. Yeah, I would I would be psyched if it got up on there as well. You know, that's been my number one, like, you know, if, if I do that, I'll be, uh, <laughs> I've I'll have it. made it in the Dungeon the, Synth scene. So yeah, I'm that's, that's basically Broadway for Dungeon <laughs> Synth. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> and I did recently actually have um, Dungeons Deep records reach out to me. Nice. Um, that's so, a huge get. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped about that. You know, there are so many different Dungeon Synth artists on dungeons deep that i absolutely love and you know I've yeah. been, um i always try to get the lps that go up on dungeons deep but they always sell they out so quick. quickly yeah. i wanted that diplodocus one really badly oh i bet um, that would be so fun yeah but either way pumped to be i don't know with um them. 
I don't know what you're allowed to share there. What's going on with that? Are, are you doing like a suite of physical releases? Uh, I what's think I'm at liberty to share. I guess I didn't okay. think about that before. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, there. yeah, it was uh, – nothing's, I guess, perfectly set or completely set in stone, but the idea was to do a cassette and an LP, so. Whoa, that is so exciting. Yeah, I'll uh, – yeah, I'm very excited about it. And yeah, know, having it on, you know, vinyl, I I would be super stoked about that. Um, yeah, that's got to be the dream, right? Yeah, I'm a big vinyl collector in general, so uh, I don't have any cassettes yet, but I guess my own will be my first one, which is kind of kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, that's like something Kanye would do or something. But uh, right, right. <laughs> you know, I whatever. think I think that's fair for the scene, though. I also don't have any cassettes. I uh, got to start collecting them. Yeah, I feel like it'd be fun. I don't know. Yeah, I never really, yeah. that was a little before my time, I think, but you know, I think it'd be a blast. So I saw online, um, you gave out some download codes for your album so people could throw them to your, to their collection. Uh, I thought that was a really neat idea. What, what made that come to mind? How did you decide on doing that? Well, I joined a Facebook group for Dungeon Synth and people were just doing that. And I was like, Hey, I can, I can <laughs> do that. Like people who are going to randomly find it here and download it. Like, aren't going to buy it and you know they might like it and so after i posted that that's when like i got this huge flood of interest um you know i think i posted 25 codes on facebook and 25 on reddit and suddenly like you know i probably gained like 70 extra like followers on the on my band camp and that's when dungeons deep reached out and wow um, what a what a secret little recipe there. That's I guess great. so. Yeah. It uh, <laughs> shows the, the virtue of, or, you know, the, the value of being generous, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose so. And, and if it gets people listening, you know, if you believe in your product, then giving out a little bit should be a, a good, uh, good way to get people listening. And if you believe in it, people listening is just what you need. So, yeah. And, and like you said, I imagine a lot of the people using those codes weren't going to pay for it in the first place. So, now they're happy to have it. You're happy to have a listener. That that really does work out. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm super happy about it. And you know, if they like it, maybe they'll uh, buy some of the merch that we've got coming out. You know, <laughs> yeah, whether the yeah. cassettes or the LPs, I've got T-shirts coming too. I'm excited about that Whoa. design. So well, yeah, we gotta it keep be fun. an eye out. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll keep you in the loop. Yeah. Yeah. So I I have a couple more questions about like the creation process for Nimway's gift. Um, sure. So, so I know from your videos online, you're super talented at playing physical instruments. Um, sounds like with your with your metal background, you've been shredding for a while. What's the breakdown for this album? Are there any physical instruments? Uh, is it so, all virtual stuff? Uh, I don't know. What's going on there? Yeah, so I'm I'm using all virtual instruments. Uh, I record in Reaper. Uh, I've got a nice. you know, MIDI, MIDI controller. Um, but I have a piano, and I've been playing piano since, I don't know, a very long time. Kind of off and on growing up, but started mm-hmm. when I was probably four years old, five years old. Um, and so for me, you know, all this stuff that I came up with, I would, you know, just be jamming on the piano and then eventually, like, come up with something that I was like, either, oh, that's mysterious and inspires wonder, <laughs> or like, ooh, that sounds medieval. Like, that's a fun little, you know... Uh, like taverny little little yeah. riff and so then i would just go downstairs from the piano to the midi keyboard and start playing that on a you know on a hurdy-gurdy or a, a some bagpipes or a <laughs> you know a, a harpsichord and was like oh now it's really medieval and then you know oh, yeah. something like that would just turn into a song so normally i'd start with like you know a chord progression or a melody you know a lot of my melodies i guess came from like whistling like i'd be like walking somewhere yeah like, you know just get a tune in my head start whistling and i'm like you know that's that's kind of that's pretty good and then i'll like record it later and be like wow i never could have come up with that if i sat down at an instrument and tried to but uh <laughs> yeah like i think i don't know a few of the melodies on companions of gallo glass came from that or like i don't know but so it's a combination of coming up with melodies and you know, trying to make the chord progressions I play on the piano sound air quotes medieval and yeah, yeah, that's it, kind of. Can the you explain that if if you were to give the shortcuts, uh, how do you make them? When you say sound medieval, is is there? Do you have like a set of technical steps that you can go? Um, you know, say you're just 
whatever, playing block chords, playing for a measure. How could you spice that up, make it sound medieval? Yeah, so I would say the main things are like a lot of medieval rhythms are kind of repetitive, right? Because it's like a song that, you know, maybe a, a bunch of people in a some folky type setting could all sing together. So the rhythm's yeah, usually a constant yeah. sort of pounding thing. So I, you know, find a rhythm I like for that and, you know, apply it to the chord progression. Um, and then a lot of the times I'm doing trills. I find trills, especially on a reed instrument, just bring out that sort of bagpipey, I don't know, medieval yeah. streets kind of feel that. And then oftentimes like sustained octaves above or below the the melody note help to kind of fill out the sound in a way that I think, you know, modern, modern music doesn't really like sustained octaves, especially vocally. Um, doesn't tend to like sustained octaves because they feel kind of old in, in mm-hmm. their sound. I'm not sure why that is, but um, in the instruments that I view as more having like a more, vocal sonorous tone to them i'll you know hold out an octave sometimes maybe examples of that being like at the end of um the very end of bold bertillac bester of boars uh there's some sustained octaves above or below the melody so things like that a lot of trills though a lot of uh triplets um yeah trying to think of anything else i think that's most i mean that's a pretty good rundown it, it's definitely a genre with a lot of like expressive, like idiomatic ideas, um, especially on an instrument by instrument basis. It, it sounds like you really captured all of those. Uh, I don't know all of those little little concepts and apply them really well. Tried to. I mean, and you know, there's probably dozens more that I can capture, and you know, maybe in future releases, a uh, highlight to uh, you know different extent as well. So yeah, and and when you're using these virtual instruments, do you mind? Uh, I don't know, just kind of, again, sharing the secret recipe. What, Because uh, I feel like these types of virtual instruments are oftentimes hard to get right. I feel like I get a lot of like thin, crappy sounding ones, uh, but then the good ones really stand out. Um, do you have any like super recommendations, something that you just can't get enough of that makes its way onto, onto a little bit of everything? Yeah, so when I bought my keyboard, it came with, um, so it's a it's a Native Instruments keyboard. It's okay. like the complete control something or other. Oh, uh, yeah. And it came with a complete sound bank. Um, and there's, in there, there's a, a free synthesizer that came with it called Medieval Read that it just absolutely honks out. Um, <laughs> it's like a weird combination of like it almost sounds like a hurdy-gurdy but i don't know if a hurdy i don't know it, it it's like a bagpipey hurdy-gurdy kind of sort of sounding thing but it gets really low in the bass registers and you know it, it's got a great honk to it it definitely has a lot of those nasty fizzy frequencies especially when you're playing higher that just sound mm. disgusting that you need to eq out <laughs> um and like Sometimes the volume response on it is very unpredictable, but yeah, it's worth well worth it. I think you know about half of my songs, um, no, not even half. Like about half of the parts in most of my songs are written on that. Um, wow! And I sort of wrote on that akin to how I would write um, like a distortion electric guitar part in say a chorus in a metal song. Like usually panned all the way right or all the way left and, you know, taking up a lot of sonic space. And then the other guitar, so it, commonly in metal, you know, when you have rhythm guitars, you'll um, you'll pan one all the way to the right and the other all the way to the right. left. And that gives that, you know, they'll play the same riff, but it'll give a really, you know, thick sound to your mix. Yeah, that um, distortion fills out and really complements each other. Exactly. So I would do that with this, this medieval reed key and play some, you know, like... Uh, lower um register chords and you know maybe some trills here and there and like matching or underlying the the prevailing melody at the time and that would be on one side and then on the other half um i have this other uh vst that i use on every single song generally at least half the time um and that's the redtron which is it's a like a 32-bit vst um mellotron type synthesizer and I mean, it's got 
a flute setting that's amazing. It's got a string setting that sounds a lot like the flute setting, but it's still good. Um, <laughs> and then the horn setting is just beefy. So, you know, a little bit of reverb on the horn, a little bit of reverb on the medieval reed, and then pan one to the right, one to the left. Have them play complementary and similar yeah. things, but not quite the same, but in the same register. And that really filled out um, and gave it a really beefy sound. And a lot of the parts where, I, you know, I wanted to maybe pull at the heartstrings, play some rousing, inspiring stuff. Uh, like, for example, I do that almost the whole song on um, Bold Bertilak, Bester of Boers. So, um, yeah, anywhere it hits See, really hard, that's kind of, that's my approach. That's a really great approach. Still thinking of it like like how things are taking up space in the mix, treating those reed instruments the way you would treat a distorted guitar is, is so funny to say out loud, but it makes so much sense. Um, I can really see how you get like a nice filled out, fleshed out mix like that. Yeah, it. I. I think. I think it worked. So I guess. Yeah. One thing I did, I guess, to maybe unpack that even a bit more is, um, one thing I did find is that, like, I found some. I was looking for art for the album, and I found this old picture. Um, I think it was like a 15th or 16th century woodcut, you know, those sort of engraving style mm-hmm. art. And you might see like Gustave Doré or I don't know, any number of other cool old artists uh, make stuff like that. But it was this picture of like what a like Renaissance-ish looking like musical group would be like. And the, the instruments they had there were a flute, a dulcimer, a lute, and I think a drum. Oh, and some reed, like a reed instrument. And I like looked at that and I was like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. You got the dulcimer in a really high register and, you know, a lot of melodies are going to be on the flute, a little bit of a lower register. And then yeah. maybe you're playing the lower notes on a, a lute and, you know, underlying that with a reed instrument somewhere. And uh, I tried to make that the core of my sound. Um, where I, don't I know, love like, that. The historical accuracy there. Yeah. Just, I mean, you know, not 100%, but trying to at least the spirit of it is there. So like songs yeah. like a light or the marshlands, you know, it's pretty much like a lute sounding harp. I think it's Irish harp that I use throughout that. Um, okay. But you know, similar to a lute and then lots of flute melodies and then, you know, bringing in the reed instrument here and there. Um, but yeah, trying to stay true to that. And like, I feel like that really helps fill out that medieval vibe to it quite a bit as well. Do you find that you have to show a lot of restraint to uh like maybe you hear something in your head that sounds good but not medieval is that something that you just green light it or do you have to do you you hold back there you know that's a good question i find that so many of the things i write when i first write them just end up being too convoluted where it's like, ah, this is going to be a sweet riff or you know whatever and i play it on the piano and it's like all right i need to like cut this back you know, by like four times. Cause there's just way too many notes. <laughs> I definitely think I have like the tendency to, you know, get a little too excited with the number of notes I'm playing. So I, I yes, have to trim yeah. that back a lot. And generally when I'm trimming that back, I mean, if it sounds good to me and it doesn't sound medieval, I'll usually leave it as long as there's enough other medieval stuff going on. But there were definitely okay. some songs where I was writing them and I was like, oh, man, like I've got a lot here, but two minutes to five minutes just sounds like a Beatles song. And that's just <laughs> not right. So, you know, I had to trim that out. That was uh, like Corey of the men here. Carver was really like that where really? I, don't know, I struggled with it for a long time. And it was like, it's too convoluted. It's poppy. I wanted it to be like major key and upbeat and, you know, nice and light. And, yeah. uh, I don't know. It was just sounding like a Beatles song to me and not medieval. And like, uh, I, I probably, you know, dropped and came back to that song like three, four times over the months. And, uh, eventually I paired it back just to like one main riff and built everything around that and like made sure that one sounded medieval. And, you know, I think that one worked out really well. It's one of my favorite tracks. So yeah, but it's had nice to pair it back that a lot. struggled. And now that it's all said and done, it's what you wanted. Uh, I don't know. You definitely see that a lot with music. I th- I think non-musicians may not realize kind of the pain of writing something that you think is really cool, but doesn't just doesn't fit the vibe of the project. And you either have to scrap it or tweak it so much that you're getting rid of things you might have liked. It's difficult. Yeah, it's painful. Oh, for sure. But uh, <laughs> I guess you can always put a pin in it for a later project and 
hope that it you know maybe works better down the road or for some other vibe you know yeah is there anything that that you put a pin in for bone weaver that you thought you know what this is just going to work better for bone weaver i'll save it oh Uh, like synth stuff yeah i guess while you were making this uh you know if if so much of your musical history is steeped in this this metal i imagine something just comes out that's great but not what you wanted do you save that or do you get fully focused on 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 your current project yeah, so there, are, I would say there are maybe like five different um, oh. little synth, like they're usually about between 15 and 30 seconds, but sort of like dissonant, crunchy synth things that I wrote on. They're like digital recreations of analog synthesizers that I want, but don't have the money for. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I would write something on there and I'm like, oh, that's crunchy. That needs to go on a metal project. And so like, I've got those saved. I also have a number of things that I wrote that are like, this could be Elevalon, but it's going to be a different Elevalon album. Um, ah, so. yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, an- another thing with this current album, so reading the notes, it looks like you got it professionally mastered. Um, can you talk about that process at all? What what made you choose to go with that? It, it Maybe how you picked someone to master it and what you were hoping to get and, and if you got it? Oh, for sure. Um, so I actually released... The Long Way Down, the, the Bone Weaver album that I released mm-hmm. through the same studio. I ended up, I like recorded everything myself. And then once it was done, air quotes done, uh, went to that studio mm-hmm. and re-recorded everything and, you know, uh, worked with them uh, to mix and master it. And actually, like the guy who owns the studio, we're good friends. We were in a band together in high school um, and like he owns a studio now. So pretty much every album i'm gonna do i'll have him professionally mix and master it because you know it's just how i'm gonna operate so uh yeah yeah yeah. he does a great job i'm always really happy with uh everything that comes out of radon studio it's super high quality stuff and uh yeah it's he's you know really easy for me to work with especially since you know he taught me so many of the recording techniques i know like we're generally on the same page about what we want and uh, yeah. you know, make something good together. So, and I'm super happy with how the, uh, you know, how the sound of it came out of it. So nice. Yeah. You can't beat that personal relationship as a background with something like that. Um, but yeah, with dungeon synth, it's such a loose genre that uh, I'm always curious, like when people make decisions like that, um, like I, I kind of approach my, uh, my current full length, much more casually and i thought about getting it mastered and i just kind of didn't um (laughs) i guess just to be cheap i I can't really think of why i didn't but now for the next one i feel like i'm gonna go whole hog and try to get it mastered and i don't know that's that's something always on my mind absolutely might be get a good move um if if you need a reference let me know i can definitely uh get you in touch but also i i was a little worried with mine like is it gonna be you know because there's there's sort of a mystique that a lot of uh you know dungeon synth folks have where you know it should be underground and uh right you right. know lo-fi and all that stuff and i was wondering if maybe i was making a strategic blunder but i don't know i just wanted to go with the best sound possible and something that makes me happy so that's what yeah. i'm with yeah, I've kind of got the same approach because I know that a lot of people really care about sticking to that core, like very raw sound. But uh, yeah, yeah, same with you. I'll, I'll, I don't know, give up on that to prefer like a cleaner sound if I can. Um, so yeah, that's that's in the future for me, I think. So you said that uh, the Curse Bitten release, um, what it's to seize it with your own hands. That's what it's called, right? Yeah, no. seize it with thine own hands. Yeah. I, first <laughs> off, I love that title, and it kind of reminds me of the whole like uh, Elevalon thing I have going on about like you know go out and find your adventure and whatnot. Yeah, sort that's of nice. But uh, so you're saying that wasn't uh, like professionally mixed or mastered or anything? No, like that? that was just all Trev. It was all okay. me. Well, you did a good <laughs> job. I'm I'm definitely a big fan of that. Uh, that oh, release. thank you. I've actually you. been like before. You know, leading up today, I was like, you know, I should, I should uh, spin that some more. So I've been listening to that a bunch this week. I'm uh, nice, excited nice. to hear really the next stuff that. you come up with. It. I was actually curious if you don't mind me turning the tables on you right oh, now please, in this interview. Yeah. <laughs> but you've been releasing those singles. Um, are those going to be part of like a, a full album later, or because yeah, like, it's off, kind of a weird spot. Okay, the, the art's awesome. I love the art, and they're the songs themselves are like 
you know, the, like I think it's some of the best stuff you've done. And so oh, I'm like, I, I hope that's on an album, but even if it's not, whatever you release next is going to be pretty killer. So, uh, you, you just buttered me up at this point. I really oh, appreciate it. <laughs> but no, no, I love it. Yeah. First off, the art is really cool. Um, Grack draws on Instagram does the art. I, I think that you guys, uh, you gave her one of your codes if I remember right, but, uh, she's the one who clued me into your album actually. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, the art is just out of this world good. Um, and, and it's kind of a tough spot. I feel like I like releasing singles to kind of keep the ball rolling. Um, I want people to think about Chris Bitten more than just when I put out an album. Um, but then there's kind of the other side. If I just put out a single every time I make a song, then what's there to listen to when the album comes out? <laughs> so... uh <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to stick to these two, maybe a third single, and then release like like an eight or nine track album, and they'll all be on it, but uh, th- those will be like a sneak preview or something like that. Okay, very cool. Well, excited to hear more of it. So, yeah, You mentioned um, future Elevalon music. Uh, is that something that you've you've started? Because you said some stuff's like, that fits, but but not for this release. Have you thought of what the next release will sound like? Um, what will be different about it? Anything like that? Or is, I know it's been like three weeks, so, so maybe that's too far in advance. Well, so not a single new note of Elevalon has been written. But okay. planning, song titles, themes, um, you know, the inspiration, the types of music... Uh, that are going to go into it and uh, all, all the groundwork for the metaphysical space that future albums are going to occupy and what I want people to feel is done for several releases at the very least. Um, several releases. Oh, I, man. Yeah. I don't want to get too into the details. and Yeah. Know, if it's all right much. for me to ask, are you thinking of um, like a continuous – like a story or some sort of sequence when you plan this far ahead? Or do you just have so many things you want to do that they start to stockpile? So it's more the latter. I don't want to do a single concept um, because really I think each song on its own can be a little story. And, you know, I I want people to feel free to imagine whatever headspace uh, and whatever, uh, you know, landscapes or vistas they want to imagine in their head i don't want to box them in with a specific story um and i'm happy to you know write some prose about you know what i feel and you know what inspired this um but i i I have a number essentially i have a a number of different vibes (laughs) that i'm going for um or like loose ideas that are kind of hard to describe in a few words but like you could exist in that soundscape and like i want to explore that soundscape so to to kind of uh give a few summaries here like one of them is going to be very nautical themed um i don't think there's much dungeon synth out there that really takes on like an old timey you know sailing the seas type vibe but i really want it to feel like very unmitigatedly nautical um, so that's going to be a big one. I've got the art figured out. I've got, you know, music that's inspiring me for it. And I've got, you know, a bunch of melodies that I'm going to try and incorporate. That'll be fun. Um, that's too cool. So that one I'm super excited about. There's going to be another one that's entirely troll themed. Uh, entirely troll themed. Troll themed. The end. All about trolls. <laughs> so we've got some uh, hit track titles like Moss Laden and Shambling. Um, oh. So that should be fun going to bring in some more you know some like really deep woods black metal influences but also some also some like scandinavian folk influences okay Um, and you know kind of try to paint a picture there i've got the art figured out for that one as well um i've got like a full sort of black metal old school dungeon synth styled uh ring wraith themed album coming together uh, thematically and then there's going to be one that's going to be for a holiday it's going to be themed around a holiday and i'm going to try and release it around that holiday that i'm extremely excited about i don't think anyone's really delved into that in dungeon synth yet and wow have good feelings i respect that that you you have your secrets there but i'm dying to know what holiday 
I got to keep an ear out. Got to keep, <laughs> keep listening. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I'm thinking, uh, probably not this year, but oh, okay. We'll, okay. Uh, we'll get there. I, I still have to write the whole thing, but you that's know. true. Maybe, maybe one of them. And it'll probably be parts shorter, of the album but... is writing it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. But thematically, it's there. The art's there. So I've got a I lot of different. People don't understand how how much time does go into the not music stuff, though. Uh, yeah, it's if a you lot. want to be cohesive, yeah. yeah, there's there's yeah. a lot of you know you have to be intentional about it, or it it won't you know hit that particular vibe you're going for. So right, right. It's I, to me that doesn't come so naturally. Like thinking of song names. Uh, I think the only songs for my new album that have been named are the ones that I had to name because they're singles. Uh, and gotcha. in one of those, I just asked the artist what she thought. And and, and they oh. kind of, just kind of ended up being named after the cover art more than anything. Is that yeah. to stare down the heavens? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was one that I just like the music. It's Sometimes it can be so difficult for me to... Uh, I don't know to like latch on to an idea. It sounds like you're full of them. Like you don't have that that issue if you're writing troll songs and boat music and all that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's more for me. It's like, man, I really want to convey this weird idea in my head about this sort of type of adventure, and um, that's you know, music is a, really a lesson powerful there. way to do it. Yeah, I gotta take that approach. Maybe that that sounds excellent. Yeah, I'd highly recommend it. But also what you're doing is working, so <laughs> don't change it too much or sure, sure. don't feel obligated to change it. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up, I saw from uh, Scouting Online, uh, you had mentioned with your Elevalon release that you pictured it for being a good fit for d and uh, I was wondering if that was something you're personally into and amongst like the Arthurian legend and things like that, if any Forgotten Realms... Uh, lore kind of creeps into your songwriting oh that's interesting so there you know i don't really have any D D lore in my songwriting but i i mean i actively play dungeons and dragons i have a group right now and nice. oh man it's been a blast um <laughs> definitely a huge fan of dungeons and dragons i uh along with one of my friends in high school we started a D club in my high school and oh man. you know so i'm big on it i've never gotten too into the lore and have been more into like homebrew type stuff most sure, of the time yeah um but i've been meaning to get more into the lore because um well my uh current campaign is coming to a close and uh, the guy who's dming oh. it is passing up the reins because he's in like med school and you know like That'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently has more important things to be doing, which I'm not Somehow. so sure is the case, but you know, <laughs> um, but it looks like I'm going to be taking up the reins on that. And so wow. I've just been writing pages and pages of world building and coming up with all kinds of Are wild, you going to go fully ideas. homebrew for years? I, I mean, you know, like I'm not making my own rules and stuff, but I am making my own like archipelago of islands and my own, it's going to be a mystery. Sure, yeah. It's like mystery pirate themed. It's going to be fun. Wow. Um, so a lot of whodunits and you yep. know, trying to uncover secret plots and, you know, like I don't seedy know if back you're familiar, alleys. Yeah. If you're familiar with Salt Marsh, but that's like a setting and campaign, um, not in Forgotten Realms, but in the D&D universe in uh, another one called Greyhawk. And uh, that's what my friends and I have been running. That's one of ours. And it's all like, nautical pirate the the whole nine yards so when you mentioned this this nautical album totally my ears perked up went to that oh, that's got to yeah. come out before the campaign ends okay yeah that's a good point <laughs> i'll uh i'll keep that in mind that could be a good way to uh, prioritize this project um, yeah there we go so yeah but that's sweet i you know i've never really gotten too much into the various worlds of D D, and i really should because from what i understand there's some amazing stuff in there and pirate themed D D is the most fun thing ever i think so <laughs> yeah. yeah it's and there's essentially endless lore just you could read like 10 wikipedia pages a day and you wouldn't crack the surface absolutely uh, but i like that i i guess if you're a tolkien guy i'm sure you appreciate that type of thing Oh, for sure. Yeah, d and a blast. And I think it's as much fun as the group you're hanging out with. And, like, for me, sure. I'm, I'm big into, like, the just the idea of, like, coming up with a character that's 
not going to make the same decisions that you are. You're like, all right, I have to like alter my perceptions and, or like my, my thinking in order to be this character and like, you know, not just do the perfectly logical thing every time. I think that's such a blast when you can really, you know, create this alternate personality. Yeah. Switch it's like into a mental it. so exercise cool. to that. It's yeah. so fun. So yeah, total blast. So I have one more thing. I know we're starting to push an hour, but, uh, like one more concept that I kind of wanted to talk about. So you've got all of these videos where you're in nature playing a ton of music and uh, they're super cool. And I'm, I'm just curious about that. I'm curious about the logistics of how you're out there doing a bunch of takes with metal and post rock in the middle of the woods, um, how you pick your spots, what, what, what all goes into that? Well, uh, since you ask, it, it it's pretty tough to be honest. Um, but really? I don't know, like the post rock side of it, I think it really calls for you know going out and being in nature. Um, and so I built a tiny little pedal board, which I attached like a a pedal power. It's uh, I don't remember the name of it. Like it's a like daisy a little, chain. Well, it, it's like a brick power supply for oh, pedals. Okay, okay. It was pretty expensive because pedals use a lot of power. Yeah. But what I do is I have a little portable battery powered amp, and then I have my little portable pedal board that I can get four little pedals on. I throw on a, um, if you know, listeners are familiar with guitar pedals, uh, great. And if not, bear with me, but it's called a Boss uh, RC2 Loop Station. Um, okay, yeah. So you can like record yourself. Um, you know, like essentially just analog. Rec- I think it's an analog. I don't know. It's probably both analog and digital. <laughs> I don't um, know how it works. But yeah, you like record DI direct input takes of your guitar. So I'm out in the woods recording like direct takes of my guitar onto this little pedal. And then, you know, I'll get like 10 of them and I'm setting up a camera with a tripod trying to get cool artistic shots of myself. And then I'll, uh, once I have it all, you know, the hardest part is getting out into the woods with like, two to three guitars, my whole camera set up, yeah. pedal board and a stool yeah. to sit on. And But once I have it all out there, you know, it's like two hours maybe if I've practiced my parts enough um, of like shooting different takes and, uh, you know, trying to, it's it's mostly about getting like the artsy looking like nice angles is the hardest oh, part. Yeah. Um, but once I get, you know, those, I've got them all, I've got all the takes on my camera and all the takes on my, um, my loop station. And so then I just take that inside and, uh, direct input it into my, I have a little USB interface that goes directly into Reaper. So I record those takes into Reaper and it's as if I had recorded it at home into my computer. Wow. So you're not actually listening to the tone when you're in the woods. You're just going into the pedal. Well, it goes into the pedal and then the other side. So I go into the pedal and then I've got like, you know, an overdrive and a a delay and a reverb or something. And that goes into a little battery powered amp. And so I'm using the amp for monitoring. Oh, interesting. But that's not the sound that comes out. It's whatever you put that RC2 into. Exactly. Because that's And and the RC2 has a a shockingly sophisticated saving bank system. Yeah, Um, it's nice. Yeah, yeah. We used to use that uh, when I was in a like an emo band. We would save transitions in the RC2 and then play them while we were changing tunings. And you can save a ton of them. Like like you said, like many tracks, and then you can recall them later. It's not like uh, like you have it until you start it again. But that's just crazy. I wouldn't think to the whole process. I wouldn't have thought to do it that way. It's it's insane that that's what you came up with. Yeah, it's just the first thing I thought up, but uh, yeah, it seems to be. It working sounds well so enough. convenient to to just have to worry about like powering the pedal for the most part, and then just the battery powered amp for monitoring. <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun, and I, it's it's nice because the the amp I have, I can plug my phone in and play the track that I'm playing along to, and it'll put it in parallel with the monitoring for the guitar I'm playing. So it, mm. you know, I can hear it alongside what I'm doing perfectly and you know oh man then I don't have to worry about headphones in the forest and you know works out pretty well and and so how do you select your sites for that um I do you do you have like a specific spot a specific place planned out or are you uh I don't know like just wandering through the woods until someplace speaks to you yeah so I ended up um leaving a job about the, 
late this past summer, and I went up to a cabin in the woods in northern Michigan, um, where my family's had a place there oh, for wow. a long time. Like so Upper Peninsula, or it's or, um, Lower on the other Peninsula. Side. Um, okay, Lower Peninsula, but it's like on Lake North. Huron. Like, yeah, the more wow. northern part of uh, the Lower Peninsula on Lake Huron. It's super remote in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so, you know, there are a bunch of different hikes in the area that I know about and that I'm like, ooh, this would be pretty. And so I'll get all my stuff, you know, pack up my camera bag and uh, get a couple of guitars and go on a hike out that way and kind of stake out a spot. And then, you know, it's wherever I can get those good sunbeams, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll set up there and hope the light doesn't change too much. So, Wow. Wow, well, that's like an entirely other super interesting thing that I didn't anticipate hearing. Yeah, well, glad to uh, <laughs> I don't know, be able to regale you with all sorts of different stories, I guess. Absolutely. So that's all I've got in my notes. Is uh, there anything you want to dive into or anything you want to say before we get going? I mean, you know, I've, I've had a blast talking about this stuff. Um, I really appreciate the attention to detail and all the questions and, uh, yeah, honored to have been a part of, uh, this podcast. You know, I've been enjoying all the episodes and being able to be episode number five is truly an honor. So just wanted to say thank you and best of luck with this podcast. You know, the dungeon synth community is awesome and having something like this to rally around. I think it'll be, it could be, you know, really big and really cool. And I wish you the best with it. So thank you. Ah, oh, absolutely. That's so kind. Um, do you have anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, yes, if people haven't been able to figure it out, the the album's Nimway's Gift. It's uh, Elevalon. Uh, it's just elevalon.bandcamp.com, right? Yep. Yes, sir. So, yeah, you can okay. find it on Bandcamp. Um, if, you know, you're interested in what I'm doing going forward, I, I post stuff on... Um, it's my Instagram account, weaves underscore bones. It's like Bone Weaver, my metal project, um, which morphed into, you know, I'm making Dungeons <laughs> 2 now, so maybe I could come up with a new name. I don't know. But yeah, if you want to check out what I'm doing there, feel free to give me a follow and you'll see what I'm up to. So Nice. And is Bone Weaver just boneweaver.bandcamp.com? Yep, exactly. Cool. And both of those, you can get them on streaming sites too, right? Yep. Spotify, Google Play, uh, Apple, YouTube. So nice. I think we got it all. Yeah. I think so. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. You've been so kind and super cool to hear about all this. Yeah. Thanks, Trev. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. So take care. All right. Take care. See everyone. See you. You just heard a lovely interview with Tristan from El Avalon. What a great dude. That was just an overwhelmingly wholesome and positive episode, but uh, really informative too. There seems to be just a ton of deliberate and intentional choices with their music, and it's so great to get the scoop on how he makes it all happen. El Avalon is doing big things within the genre, so if you haven't listened to their debut album, Nimue's Gift, get on that. Check it out. It's so good, you really don't want to miss out on it. You can stream their music on all of the standard streaming services, and you can also check it out at elevalon.bandcamp.com. And they've also got social media. You can find them at weaves underscore bones on Instagram. And then as always, if you'd like to follow Cursebitten underscore on Instagram, or just search Cursebitten on YouTube, you can keep up with me and you can stay in the loop on uh, new podcast episodes, new music, all of that good stuff. I've already recorded more episodes, and I don't know, there's just so much that I'm so excited to share. Like, I seriously, truly can't wait. Uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff in the can. But alright everyone, thanks so much for your time, thanks for your attention. Get out of here, take care, bye. Bye.